Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of Padma Jana Medical College Alumni Association of North America. First of all, I would request all of you to please mute your mics so that uh, everybody can listen whatever is going to be discussed today. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Fiza Rafiq, and I'm a past president, past president of Padma Jana Medical College Alumni Association of North America. I'm a family physician working in Calgary and I am a clinical assistant professor with Cummings School of Medicine in Calgary. I'm involved with teaching medical students, residents, and I am also an examiner in Canadian residency programs. Today, we have a team of experts with us who are going to give you advice on how to prepare for residency interviews. And first of all, I want to congratulate all of you who have already done through their, who have already gone through their exams and application process. And now it's time to prepare for residency interviews. For some of you, this must be the first time to appear in the interviews for any job. And for some of you, it might be the second time or multiple times, but still we learn from each and every, every experience down the road. And each and every experience gives us more self-awareness and confidence. So now certain agenda items. Uh, first of all, Dr. Laila Hashim will share her presentation on how to prepare for residency interviews followed by a comprehensive review on tips of um, interview process by um, APNA YPC Chair, Dr. Noman Ashraf. Then we will open the floor for interactive Q&A session and feel free to write your uh, questions in the chat box and a team of experts um, and panelists will answer your questions. So now without further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Laila Hashim to start her presentation. Dr. Laila Hashim is PGY2, Department of Internal Medicine, University of Oklahoma, and she, we are very proud of her, her achievements. She is a graduate of Fatma Jana Medical University. So Dr. Laila Hashim. Thank you so much, Dr. Fiza. Hi, Assalamualaikum, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Laila Hashim. I'm uh, one of the second years resident at the University of Oklahoma. I'm very pleased to be here among you all today. Um, I prepared like a 10 to 15 minute slide presentation for you all just kind of to begin with in the interview residency, you know, preparation process. Obviously, this is like a long road and you guys will learn through each phases of it. But today, the discussion is going to be just generally very basic and how to approach this process. So I'm going to just um, share my screen with you all and I've pre prepared just a few slides to go through. Um, and then we can talk about these things as I go through the slides. Hopefully, you all can see the uh, screen that I just shared. Okay, let me see. Is everyone able to see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, can go all right. Awesome. All right, so, um. Honestly, to begin with, I just wanted to like talk about why residency interviews are important. Generally, as IMGs, it's seen like a very, um, you know, uh, hectic process, a very nerve wracking process to start, you know, beginning the interview process. But it, it can be an enjoyable part of your residency uh, math cycle as well. Honestly, um, it's important for you guys as well as equally as important it is for the programs um, to, you know, kind of evaluate each other and find a best suit for yourself. And the programs also do the same thing. So it, it, it's kind of, I would say it's kind of two-way process. The program, uh, you know, kind of evaluates you to see how well you align with them, um, how, how well you will be successful in their program and how well enough you will be able to make their program successful. But at the same time, it's also, I mean, your thing as well. At the end of the process, you'll be choosing a program um, that's, gonna, that's going to be determined, you know, the few, very few, but the most important years of your life. That is the residency, residency years of your life. Um, so by the end of this process, I think you guys should be happy and confident confident with choosing the program that is best, you know, suitable for you all um, and make an informed decision. So I would say that it's it's kind of two-way process, make it enjoyable. Just don't be, um, don't be a lot of, you know, uh, don't have a lot of tension around it. And as, as you approach all the programs, um, just individualize your interview process through that program and see how well you evaluate that particular program. 
Now, I have basically divided my um, presentation into three parts. Um, the first part would generally talk about what should you do before the interview. So by now, you all have kind of you know, um, submitted your applications, you guys are waiting to receive interviews, some of you might must have received the interviews. So once you receive the interviews, now is the process to start preparing for it. Um, and apart from like just preparing for the interview process in general, you should know a lot of things about the programs as well um, that you are going to interview with. So I would say gather as much as information you can about the program. First of all, the program that you got interview from. Um, there are a lot of resources that you can gather your information from, for example, programs website. Um, if there are a lot of programs that have updated websites, but honestly, when I was going through my process, there were a few programs that whose websites were not you know, pretty updated. Um, so that's fine. Just gather as much information as you can from their website. If you know any current residents over there, that's a good thing as well to talk to the residents. But honestly, residents, a lot, a lot of the times, they don't have a lot of time, you know, to respond to your questions. But if you know um, someone personally and that person is kind of free, they have time to talk about it, just go ahead and talk to them about it. Um, I didn't mention it in here, but a lot of programs have social media, um, you know, handles as well, like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so just make sure that, you know, you guys go through um, those things as well. And a lot of programs will send you pre-interview materials as well whenever they will send you the interview invites. So just go through all those materials very thoroughly because they will mention uh, basically how your interview day will look like, the timing of your interviews, how how many number of interviewers you you will have and who will be your interviewers. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's, it's a good idea to kind of, you know, uh, go through some of your interviewers' information as well, like a program director, their interests, um, and stuff like that. But, um, but it's going to be like a conversation process during the interview. Um, second, now um, you, you went through the website. Now is the time to prepare for the interview. Um, honestly, you just need to know what kind of questions um, you're going to be asked. So basically nowadays, I think the interview questions are generally divided into three basic groups. Some general questions about yourself, some behavioral questions where they'll ask you a certain situation in your life and what did you learn from that particular situation um, or behavioral questions. And then situational questions will be just basically, um, they can give you a hypothetical scenario uh, and they can ask you what should you do in this scenario or what would you do in this scenario. Um, but the important part about these questions is that um, you can generalize it whenever you don't have any specific answer to them, but being specific um, about those questions is what makes you, you know, um, what, what stands you apart from the rest of the candidates. So by this, I mean that with the start of your residency interview process, just start reviewing your CV, start reflecting on your experiences in life and identify some of the things that makes you unique, you know, some of the situations that you think will best um, exemplify your skills, right? And then consider um, just making a small list of these experiences and kind of, you know, put them together and see where those experiences fit best in the behavioral and general questions as well. Um, so these things will help you, I think, to be more specific in your interviews, which which basically what all the interviewers look at. Um, obviously, there will be some, there will be a few things that you don't have an answer for. You don't have a specific life situation that you can relate to. And in, in those questions, you can, you know, generalize the answers as well. Um, but it's very important to identify all those experiences. And then obviously last, once you have, you, once you know what questions are going to appear, once you have identified your experiences, then just practice as much as you can. Practice is the key here. Practice with your friends, with your colleagues, with your mentors, with your peers. Do as much as mock interviews you can because with every mock interview, you will learn something new about yourself in the interview process. And everybody will have something in return to tell you as well. Um, things about things to remember about virtual interviews. I, I know you you all know um, these things by, by this time. When I was uh, doing my interviews, that was the first year of the virtual interviews. So basically having a stable internet connection, a good computer, laptop with a good camera and microphone. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, just use the device in your mock interviews that you'll be using the day of your interview. Use the place that you'll be using the day of your interview because that will kind of um, make you uh, make you familiar. You know, you you just familiarize yourself with the environment that you'll be having um, during the interview day as well. Um, and then just you know light sources and stuff like that. You all know those things. But one of the important things I think here is that um, 
Eye contact is very important. Um, virtual interviews have this thing where you have to stare at the camera and not at the screen. So one of the one of the things that I used to do was basically put my put my screen this the interview where we where I was seeing the interviewer just just below the uh, just below the camera. Um, so that would help me, you know, either look at them and and to the camera at the same time. Um, now these are like just some basic things you guys need to know before you know your interview process now once you receive the interview um and you appear um to that interview i think making the best first impression is very important here uh and by that i mean just be well prepared be well suited in a very well um you know professional way just don't be don't be too unique. Don't like it's not a fashion. Don't don't symbolize yourself. You know, just be formal. Be well prepared. Um, uh, arrive or log in early whenever you can, and then um, just demonstrate a lot of professionalism and confidence during all of your interactions during interview. So during the during the interviews, it's not only important to interact with your interviewers in a professional and confident way. It just it just is the whole thing because everyone is kind of keeping an eye on you during those sessions as well. The way you're interacting with other students, the way you're interacting with the program coordinator, um, the way you're talking to your body language when you're interacting with the residents as well. Because um, honestly, when I was um, doing my interviews, um, it, it's important. I mean, body posture is important. I don't want to like have negative remarks, but it's important that you don't yawn, you don't swing in your chair, you don't make faces, you know, because there were a few people who were doing those and it didn't look good to me, um, you know, when they were doing this stuff. So that's, that's what I've learned from, from other people. You can learn from other people as well while you're doing your interviews. Um, so just maintain professionalism and, you know, be confident during interviews. This is important. Uh, whatever you put on your application, you must know what to talk about it, how to talk about it. You are the expert on your application. You are the expert on yourself. Um, and the most important thing is to be yourself and to be expert self. Okay. So know your CV very well. Um, know how to convey uh, how to how, whatever you have narrated in your CV, know how to talk about it to the interviewers. And again, this goes back to identifying those specific experiences and, you know, um, you know, your skills that you will basically be talking about to your interviewers. Um, and by preparations and practicing and doing mock interviews, we never say memorize things. Um, you can, what, what, this happened to me as well. Like when I started interviewing process, I I used to write the whole answers and just, I used to go through them, but that was not a good idea because by the time I was practicing, it looked like I was just reading through my answers, right? So um, what I did was after that, I just, for each question, just identify a few important points that you will be talking about, not write the whole thing, but just a few important points that, okay, if they ask me about myself, I'll talk about my background, I'll talk about my education, I'll talk about my um, um, experience in America, and then, and then just talk about it in a conversational way, just like you will talk uh, about it to any other person, honestly. Um, and um, just just prepare um, for this. And then sometimes um, people do this thing as well that they will ask you instead to ask them questions. So be ready for that kind of interviews as well, where your interviewers would be like, ask me anything you want to um, about my program. So during those scenarios, I think um, uh, what, what, what's important is that for every program, you must identify a few important questions that you will ask, you know, your, your faculty, your program director and stuff like that. Um, there were like, and obviously these, these program questions, honestly, they can be divided into, into a few categories, like questions that I can ask the residents, questions I can ask the PD, question I can, I can ask about the faculty as well. So you don't have to ask necessarily about, um, what a call schedule looks like from the PD. Instead, that would be a more appropriate question, I think, for the residents, right? <clears throat> and never ask about salaries or vacation time or benefits. I mean, don't ask about the information that is already present in their website, um, because I think you, when, when you skim through their website, you, you must already know about all those things. Um, yeah, these were the few important things I think that you guys should remember um, during the interview process. And obviously, when when you'll do more interviews, more mock interviews, you'll come up with specific things that you need to know. But this was just like a, just a general idea about um, what what to do and what not to do during your interview.
And um, then, then comes, you, you have done your interview. Now it's after interview time. Um, some people say sending post-interview thank you notes <clears throat> and all those things are important. There's kind of like a, both pros and cons to the process. If you go through the official websites of like uh, NRMP and stuff like that, they do not generally recommend doing this. But um, it's it, there is no harm in sending you know um, thank you emails after you're done with your after you are done with your interviews. Honestly, I did it and I received a couple of replies from the PD. So I think it's a good idea unless and until the program has specifically said no to it that you, there is no post interview communication at all that they would encourage. Um, don't do for those programs. But for rest of the in programs, you can do it. And honestly, these um, thank you notes should just be genuine and honest and whatever you thought and felt during the interview. And same is for the letter of interest as well. So by the time um, you know you approach the rank list order, people start st sending letter of interests. Um, I will not send more than two or three letters of interest, honestly, in my rank list, because if you'll send letter of interest to 15 out of the 15 programs that you interviewed with, with that just that just doesn't look good, right? You're not it, it's not a good practice, I would say. And um one of the one of the another things that would help you down the road. Um, when you are preparing your rank list order is just taking like a five minutes, not five minutes, even two minutes notes of a few important things that you felt about the program after your interview, your general impression of the program, um, something that you liked or it was unique um, as compared to the rest of the programs. Um, just just write those things down because on, by the end of your, your interview season and when you're making your rank list order, um, you all the programs would just look alike they'll they'll look similar to you so writing these notes and taking a few like quick points about um, programs um, is generally a good idea to help you with your rank list order um i think those are some important things that i just wanted to share with you guys um i'll be happy to answer any specific questions after this with uh, with other people in the panel as well thank you Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hashim. Uh, um, it was quite uh, great. Uh, you shared all the basics of uh, how to prepare for residency interviews, what to expect. And as you said, it's, uh, every, every candidate is unique with their unique experiences, so we cannot compare with each other. Um, so after this, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Noman Ashraf. First of all, Dr. Noman Ashraf, thank you so much for taking your time out on this busy Sunday morning and uh, uh, accepting our invite to join us today. Dr. Noman Ashraf is the MD Chair APNA YPC 2023. Many of you must have known him from APNA YPC Facebook page. He's very active um, and he's co-chair Papahana Education Committee, Program Director, General Psychiatry and Addiction Medicine Fellowship Programs, KCU, GME. Uh, Custodium Ozrak Center Associate Professor of Psychiatry, University of Missouri. So uh, now, uh, Dr. Noman Ashraf, you can share your thoughts. Ji, Asan, Nikum, and thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so a great pre presentation, Laila. Um, I think she has covered most of the uh, points. So I'll just uh, talk about some of the things from program director perspective. Um, first of all, congratulations again uh, for getting this far in the residency process. And if you get an interview, and, and this is a genuine interview, which means you didn't ask anyone who was in the program, who got your call, it was, they reviewed your CV, they like you, they sent you interview, that means uh, they wanna take you. So they're interested in you. So the half of the battle is already done. I think at, from there that the point, main point for you is, is not to mess it up now. So they're already interested, the faculty's interested. What they want to know is on the day of interview is, uh, who you are as a person, if you are the same person who is on the paper and um, and uh, in front of them, which means like if you had someone else write your uh, personal statement, you had a ghostwriter uh, help you out with a CV, but helping out a little bit is different, like with the grammatical mistakes and uh, coaching is different. But if if it's different thought process and the, the way the sentences are structured is not your own thought process, that would be a problem because in the interview, when you talk, it needs to match and needs to reflect. So it has to be your your own uh, thought process. So honesty is, I think, the number one thing that they're looking for, um, how true you are on the application. As Lela said, everything is a fair game. If you put down something on the CV, they can ask you about it. So a lot of time, what students do 
they feel like they have to have everything on the CV and they overdo it in this. And then mostly it happens in the domain of research. So you, you put down, you were part of the research process, you did a lot, uh, you did statistical analysis, whatnot. When, if someone who knows about it and they ask you questions, are you able to back it up? So uh, talk about the portion that you can, you actually did and you can uh, then back it up in the interview. Uh, you can always say it's a it was a team of five people or six people when you worked in a on say systematic analysis. Your uh, portion and contribution was this, this, this. You don't have to really say you are part of the statistical statistical analysis. You understand the results, but we had a stat person who did it, and and that's totally fine. So I think that the most important thing would be honesty. Then interpersonal communication skills. Of course, in medicine, you will be. Uh, dealing with the patients. So they want to know if you have interpersonal communication skills. If you have some sort of cultural competence, uh, you can work in the U.S. system. That is why the U.S. clinical uh, experience has a lot of weightage and a lot of program look at at least two to three months of experience and LORs from the doctors who are in the U.S. So um, basically what they're looking for is that you understand how uh, our cultural context is in the US. Do you know about the EMR or not? And that can also be done through observership to through exposures. Uh, but, uh, but that's something that they would be looking at. And then uh, they wanna confirm your medical knowledge. So if you scored really high on step one, say if, if it's older graduate and now it's pass fails to step two, um, they wanna know that um, you have the knowledge base and you can talk about that knowledge. So they may ask you about some clinical scenarios some clinical questions about it. And then I think the most important factor, uh, everything boils down to, are you a good fit for the program or not? If you, are you someone who can get along nicely with others or not? And that is why you would see a lot of programs have uh, different um, people that you meet with. So some programs are still doing hybrid, in-person and virtual. Most of the program majority will do virtual, so it's a little bit different. But if you have hybrid, you would see that they have a pre-dinner meetup with the residents. And that's where uh, the main thing is that you just try to be as normal as you can be yourself. You don't want to overdo anything. Uh, residents that make mistakes um, uh, sometime if other residents are drinking or whatnot and they get indulged in that behavior, everything is noticed, everything is reported. So you just want to have... Uh, uh, have a professional uh, behavior on that night. Um, if it's a virtual interview, usually how it starts is you spend about 15 minutes to 30 minutes with the coordinator. Now that is also important. And as Lela was saying that if some uh, of the residents are not interested, they'll be like, yeah, whatever, it's a coordinator. I'll talk to the faculty and, and attending and you're slouching and you're yawning and you're distracted they will have their own uh, scoring and they will report it to the program director. So um, be professional. It is an interview. You know, you've uh, done so much. You've gone this far. Take it as one of your exams and give it 100%. During that time, it's important to interact. Um, usually, suppose there are seven or eight people and there are only one or two who talk. That's those are the ones that the coordinator will remember. And when they have a meeting, they're talking to program director, he'll say, Yeah, this is the person that I think would be a good fit for the program because you were the one who was sort of the, who started the conversation. Maybe talked about just, just learn simple things like sports is very common here, everyone likes it. So, wherever you're interviewing, if they have a, if it's Kansas, if Chiefs, just learn a little bit about it. If, if you're not a fan, just you can carry on for two, three minutes. Uh, weather talks are always good. Food talks are always good. Something general, something about the city that's important. Avoid religious and political talks. Those are the two things that I would say avoid it. But otherwise, it's good to have like small talks uh, with them. And then um, you will have interviews with the uh, faculty and program director. So that already went through. There are certain questions that are for program director, certain for faculty, certain for residents. And... So some you can get information from the website and the, the these questions if you need clarification on vacation and and uh, the schedules didactics you can always ask those questions from the coordinator that's fine but those are not really questions for your faculty or uh, program director that's your time where uh, you should be asking about the program's vision where the program is going what kind of uh, applicants they are interested in what kind of changes they have made in the program those kinds of things that that really uh, would uh, 
shape your training. So you want to ask about it and you want to convey your passion and, and your interest that they are evaluating, but evaluating you, but you're also evaluating them. You also want to know about the program, if it's a good fit for me or not. So I think those are pretty much some of the main things for virtual uh, interviewing, as Lela said, record your session and then hear it, see how you sound, how your camera angle is, what is your background. Again, like I have it white uh, wall, it's amazing. Just keep it like that. You don't have to blur it, don't need to do anything. Simple background is fine. Sometime I recommend if you have something interesting, like you have a hobby, you are an artist and you have painted something, it's good. You can put that picture in the background because uh, if, so if, if I'm interviewing, I will ask about it. And then if you painted it, then your interview may be about that. And that's a strength. So, so there's an art of how to control your interview. So that's one of the tips. But the other ways to how you sort of are in control rather than your faculty or prime director is in control of the um of the interview. Uh, prepare for behavioral questions, prepare for situational questions. There's no limit to it. There's no end to it. Uh, they will ask a lot of questions. Some questions are really difficult that they will ask. And if you don't know the answer, you can always say it's an interesting question. Just give me a second. Take like a 10, 15 second pause and then answer on those questions, but not on every question. If you just take too much time on every question, that doesn't reflect good. So normal question, you should you should rehearse, you should be prepared. Do not write it. So it, it should seem like genuine. So take bullet points and then and talk about those bullet points about those questions. So I think that's uh, a little bit I wanted to share and then we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nirvana Ashraf. Uh, and I see many questions in the chat box right now, which is great. Uh, and we have a team of panelists with us too. So I will be directing a few questions. Whoever is uh, ready to answer, you can take up. So the question I see is, what are the recommendations for a pre-interview meetup with residents? Uh, Dr. Rizwana, if you want to answer this question. Um, yes, uh, I'm Rizwana Asim and I am PGY1 at UHS Psychiatry. Uh, I just want to uh, tell the candidates that if you are trying to contact the, you know, residents or just even before the meetup, if you are contacting them, uh, you saw them on the website and you just want to know about the program and uh, you want to contact them, just uh, be prepared uh, before contacting them that your application is complete. Sometimes the uh, candidates contact them and they are not, uh, their application is not complete. And they ask the residents to uh, help them with the uh, application, like uh, to forward their ID or something like that. But please uh, take care that your application is complete, your letter of recommendations are all uploaded and then contact with them. And during the meetup, yeah, ask them the questions you want to know about the program and the questions you don't want to ask from the PD or uh, other uh, faculty members, you can ask them how they are uh, feeling about the program and how they are uh, having time over there and how is faculty with the residents. You can ask all these kind of questions from them and uh, the general overview of the program. And uh, I think most of the residents, they are genuine about it and they will tell you the truth about the program and how their experiences about the program. Thank you, Rizwana. Uh, next question I see is uh, from Saman. Uh, what are some of the questions to ask the program director? So Dr. Numan Ashraf, if you wanna take this up, question. Yeah, so as I was saying, so uh, good questions would be, what changes have you brought to the program since you took over? What is your vision, uh, next five year vision? Where do most of your graduates go after they graduate from the program? Uh, how's the education um, curriculum? Uh, in the program and what are the new changes you're looking at? How is the research curriculum? Are there any changes that you're looking at on that horizon? Uh, what is the board pass rate? So all these questions would be fair to ask a program director. So, so anything that you think would shape your training and and um, and that can also reflect at the passion of the program director, you can also review the interest area of the program director. So if they are uh, certified in certain disciplines. So suppose somebody's an infectious disease um, a doctor 
and uh, that person is the PD and they have published on certain area, say COVID, they did a great uh, paper on COVID that was published in JAMA. So you may talk about it and share that you've also had interest. Maybe you also published something and that's a common interest. So I think those are the things where you can just strike a balance where your passion can match. And the general questions are always like looking ahead where they want to take the program, what changes they have made, those kinds of things. Thank you. Uh, next question I see is, and that question is, if we are given choice, what should we go for, in-person or virtual interview? So Dr. Hiba Heather, if you want to answer this question. Assalamualaikum, everybody. I'm Dr. Hiba Heather. I'm the current president of Fatma Jinnah Medical Alumni Association of North America and a general pediatrician in the community. Um, so, yeah, so that's a, a good question. Um, I would say, you know, um, personal or um, personal interview, uh, if the program is offering, would be better. It gives them give good personal interaction engagement with you guys. Um, and then they're able to see your whole personality and picture. Um, if virtual is the only option, then you have Lala gave really good tips. And I will, you know, agree with all of them. Um, you can't go around if virtual is the only option they're giving you. But if they're giving you an option between uh, personal and virtual, I would go with personal. You can show your full self um, and you have a little bit edge over, you know, showing your uh, capabilities and your communication style and everything when you're in person. That's what my suggestion would be. Your dress up or everything, each little thing has points. You will be amazed what they, I'll give you a very good example, a personal example. So when I was interviewing, um, I have a the Vietnamese um, uh, colleague who was interviewing, who eventually got the residency. So that Vietnamese guy, Dr. Nguyen, on his way to Kansas City, there were you know snow, snow, snowstorms over there. He lost all of his luggage. He only had hand baggage. Uh, sorry, he, he lo has lost his uh, baggage in which he had the interview suit and everything. Tomorrow morning was the interview and he landed yesterday night, last night. You know what he did? He went around town in an unknown town. He didn't know that city. He went around there like dozens of places where like uh, your, uh, you know, dry clean places, tailors, if anybody had a three-piece, like a uh, professional suit, if he had placed the excuse in the interview that I had lost all my luggage and I didn't have a suit to wear, they would acknowledge that. They would be okay with that. But he went all the way to find a suit and he wore it just because he wanted to be professional. But he did not tell this to anybody. He only, by the way, had this conversation and that conversation was a totally with a third person who was not affiliated with the executive leadership of like residency decision making. But they found that out, out sometimes. They were so impressed by his going all the way out of the way to make sure he makes a good impression. And that's how he was throughout residency. I second that throughout my three years with him. So I would say go personal if you can you can make the best impression. Wow, what an amazing motivational story, Hiba, you shared. <laughs> Great. No, it was such, I've, I'm impressed with him all through, up till now, I've known him 15 years. And you know, they, these things that, can happen, these things can happen, obviously, but I mean, yeah. he, he, he could have just said, oh, I lost my luggage and everything, and he could, may have not found a suit, but he did not at least give it up. Great, excellent. Okay, so next question comes, uh, what two cents for old grads during interview specifically? Should we talk more towards clinical experience? Question is coming from Zenith Habibullah. Uh, Sadaf, Dr. Sadaf, you wanna answer this question? You can unmute yourself. 
Yes, assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, um, I'm uh, the General Secretary of uh, um, FJM Tana at this time, and it's a very pleasure for me to be here with all my um, good friends, Dr. Fessa, Dr. Um, Heba, everybody who's contributing. Um, very happy to meet uh, Dr. Naman. So I will uh, say that uh, uh, contributing and uh, discussing about the clinical experience definitely is going to add to all the points. Um, they do want to put it in practical too. So the thing that what you have done, where you have applied, the way you express it, you want to summarize comprehensively in few sentences, but say as much as you can. So um, the time limits are there, the questions are many, they are going to ask you um, about a bit, um, or you can when they say uh, share your skills, you can uh, describe your clinical experiences. They are your absolute skills. Describe it in a manner that they are multiple and they are in little sentences, summarized comprehensively, so that you don't miss a moment um, describing yourself to them. Thank you, Sadaf. Um... Next question, uh, Laila, if you want to take it, should we address our red flags on our own without them asking about them or drop an explanation somewhere around the answers? No, I think um, I've already answered this question in the chat as well. I would not do this. Just, I mean, just be positive about yourself and about everything. Um, they went through your CV. Um, they read all about you in your personal statement. And as Dr. Ashraf mentioned they liked you and they sent out an invite to you and now is the time to just be positive and tell them um, what you can do for them right? rather than just you know lingering on your red flags and stuff like that just don't do that unless and until they don't ask you I, I will not talk about my red flags honestly yeah good uh, next question, Dr. Ashraf, if you want to take this how to answer behavioral questions if I don't know the answer yeah, I think I, I had mentioned earlier too. So um, you, depends on what kind of question they're asking. So what they want to know is that you don't want to say something wrong and there are multiple ways to address those questions. So that's why I had said that you can say, it's an interesting question, let me think about it. So you buy like five, 10 seconds and you put together some thought in your head. Uh, again, there are so many questions, so many uh, situations they can put you in. It's hard to um, say uh, what they will ask you. Um, if you were a bird, what bird would you want to be? I mean, there's there's no limit. If you were a book, what book would you want to be? So it's always a good idea to uh, read a book. It's always a good idea to have some idea about like the favorite movie because some um, some people want to ask about it. So you can you can have some conversation. Uh, but again, uh, the way would be you just buy some time. You think about it, uh, what the question is, and you try to come up with the best explanation, honestly. And and if you don't have an explanation, you can say, well, I'm just going to take my best shot here. And this is what it is. And it's and it's fine. They see the one question that they ask about, like, uh, tell me about your weakness. It's not like they're trying to put you down, but they want to know that you have some reflection. So the only wrong answer is I don't have any weakness, right? All the other answers are correct. So what you come up with, you can just find out anything. We all are improving. We all have some sort of um, issues we are working on. And, and you can talk about it. If you are someone who is on a weight training regimen and, and you are sloppy and you're not really hitting your goals, you talk about it. This is one of the, I'm working on, on that piece. You, you are developing your research and uh, there are different skill sets and there's one skill set that you're trying to improve on. You can talk about that. Um, some people have issues with um, like oh, when they're like they're generally slow talkers, they're generally fast talkers. Uh, and when you're communicating with the patients is different. You have to make sure patients understand it. Some people can use that as one of the areas of improvement rather than calling it weakness. Some of the areas of improvement, you can think about that way and talk about it. So the only, as I said, only wrong answer is I don't have any weakness. All other answers are completely sort of fair. So try to do your best in the situation. Buy some time if you have to, five seconds, and then come back at it. Can I add to that, please, Dr. Numan? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's good. 
So another way to uh, say that or, or sir, uh, not don't circumvent it, do take it with pride, but you have to put in communi communicate your even negatives in a positive way. For example, um, you can tell them, I sometimes take on too much than I can handle. Um, that means you are always volunteering for something and taking work, but then you tell them that, you know, but I will need like, uh, always teamwork and help me out and people who can help me, you know, we can be together in a way that you are showing that you are engaging with other people, but you are always, you know, uh, chiming in to do work. Uh, that's what one of my, you know, um, residency guides people told me. Um, and uh, that, and then if you have anything about time management, because residency is totally new skill set, it's going to be a very tough, thing to uh, kind of uh, manage yourself in at least in the first intern year coming from a different culture from uh, the way graduate education is probably in Pakistan or anywhere else as well. So in, in the beginning, you can always say there will be some time transitioning, uh, but I'm, I think I'll be very, I'm very much capable of uh, going through that adjustment and I'm looking forward to it. Um, so let them know. And they they know that, you know, everybody who comes in a residency group or match, they're all from different backgrounds, different, you know, especially the IMGs and everything. They give you that uh, transition period for every, everything. So acknowledging that up front, I don't think it's a negative. It's just knowing who you are and you bring your own positives um, to the game and the team as well. That just my two cents. Yeah, and uh, I think IMGs uh, have more experience because they're coming from different diverse groups and uh, their experience to interact with people and different groups is different than uh, local graduates. So when we interview, we see a difference of experiences. So it can be a medical experience or it can be a non-medical experience. You can share anything. Uh, and answer the question, whatever comes to you, whatever comes to your mind, any experience that you have learned through your personal life or through your medical life, engaging with different groups, different uh, teams, uh, that is uh, what counts. And it shows that how you took the leadership, how you made certain boundaries around you, how you manage your time and how you share your thoughts. So that counts at the end and which uh, and the confidence with which you talk about it. That matters. Um, yeah. And I think I would just add uh, one thing into it as well, that whenever we talk about our experiences back in Pakistan, um, just be proud of what you did back there. Um, that's like, a, I have seen people may, maybe talking, like, you know, in a negative way about their experience back home, that it's not up to date, it's not best, it's compared to America, but just don't do that. Just be proud of whatever you did back back at home um, and put it in a very positive way. They like it. I mean, people over here like this as compared to when you start talking negative about whatever you did in the past or your, your, in your interview, you just need to be positive for everything you have done. You have to share your positive thoughts about that experience and that counts. Um, next is uh, Dr. Rizwana, if you wanna take this question that even if we haven't applied for a couple of matches, can we mention our spouse applying to the same program or different program or same hospital during the interview? Um, I didn't get this question that well. Like if didn't apply for a few years, like is it a gap or just after the yeah, so release? Or just... applied, if we have not applied for a couple of matches, can we mention our spouse applying for the same program or different mm -hmm. program but same hospital? Yeah. Meaning it's the same uh, I, program. I think, yeah, I think there is no harm in mentioning that they are applying because many hospitals, they like if the both uh, uh, husband and wife, they are applying in the same hospital or they're in the same hospital working already or they are uh, they have intention to work in that hospital. I think there's no harm in mentioning that one. So the only caveat I would add is uh, as long as the couple's application is comparable, if their application is very bad, uh, you're gonna damage your chances too so uh, that's uh, that's the thing that couple has to decide so somebody is a gunner really good at scores the other partner has failed uh, so many times then i would just have the person who has a good cv secure the spot and then help out the other person if your com uh, applications are comparable and okay then of course you mention it and you go together 
Yeah, some, sometimes it can be positive and sometimes it can be negative too to share that. So keep that in mind. Okay, so um, uh, Laila, if you want to take this question, yeah. what things we should tell in when they say introduce yourself? Tell us about yourself. I mean, that's the first question usually when we ask them. Tell us about yourself. It's, uh, tell about yourself. I mean, um, I don't know. There are a lot of uh, ways people approach this question. I would just, you know, tell you how I did. I basically started talking about my home and family. And then where, and because I, you know, I, I don't want to talk about myself here, but my home, family, my education, and then my experience um, in America and what I look forward to basically in the program. It shouldn't be too long. Um, I think 90 seconds to two minutes, like 90 to 120 seconds max should be the answer. Um, and um, you people have personalized it. People have like maybe um, mentioned a small, you know, um, a very unique thing about themselves. If they're interested, for example, in sports, if they have um, any artistic, you know, view of life and stuff like that. Um, you can add those things um, into your about yourself it just generally should not be only academic oriented question it, they're, they're asking about yourself so just don't um talk only about your education and your you know observership externships just don't talk about those things talk about yourself your family what you're interested in what are your hobbies and what are you looking forward to basically um during the interview and in the program generally yeah i think the first question is always uh the opening question is tell me about yourself and actually mm -hmm. Uh, this is the main question that that is going to create your impact on the interviewer as well so it yes. should be uh, uh, you know the answer should you should be ready for this how are you going to take this um, you know conversation into uh, the whole conversation will be around this when they're going to start you know your interview um, so I'll, I'll just add uh, um, something so uh, one way to look at it to take the pressure off is it's an icebreaker so you will be asked like tell me about yourself or Tell me a little bit about your journey. However they do it, it's an icebreaker, right? Um, if you know the program director uh, who is an, an okay, stable gentleman, then sometimes um, people do like, they start off with a joke. Like I, I remember one example, one of the applicants was like, tell me about yourself. Well, it all started in the winter of 1980 when I was born. And the and the program director is laughing and the uh, other person is laughing and they broke the ice and then the interview started, right? So it doesn't have to be that much pressure question mm -hmm. now, but you don't know who is the interviewer. Maybe it's someone who is a very uptight person. And you don't want to joke with them. So you have to feel uh, the air in the uh, in the room. Uh, so prepare for it. And as Leila said, uh, you can have all those components uh, when you answer. Try to talk about your uh, uh, why you're interested in the field of medicine in that too. 90 second is the sweetest part if you can hit that. And, and one thing that Leila was talking about is if you can talk about your hobbies or artistic abilities, I think if you leave it at the end, then you kind of, as I was saying, you control the interview. So if you, at the end, you just drop it that, um, but as a, in my college, I was um, uh, the president for, or um, the captain for my team for basketball and I played at the national level. Most of the people will ask you a question. Oh, you did play at the national level. Tell me more about it. And then you are in control of the interview. That's your strength. That's where you can shine. So it's an art of who controls it, how you answer. You got to be a little bit confident. You have to know your strength. And then you have to practice. Yeah, good. So every one of you yeah. has to prepare for this very first question. And everyone is going to be unique. So no one can tell you what to tell in that. Because you know your uh, you know talents and what is the best in you so bring that out on that day uh, next is um question is can we give examples of situations in the interview that we already discussed or mentioned on personal statement or experience in eras you can i mean there's nothing uh, that's stopping you the, the thing is where do you use the example how do you bring it up into the conversation so uh, it's always good talking about stories but those stories should reflect certain skill sets that the job is looking for, right? It's a it's a on-job training. So you get paid. It's also a job. They are employer, your employee, they're hiring you. So just like any other job, if somebody's hiring you, what is the skill set you bring to the table? 
So if you uh, did some volunteer work and you were a leader of a team and you served in a remote area and there was a calamity and, uh, and, and you were there and there were multiple things that happened, you learned leadership skills, you learned conflict resolution skills, you learned how to work in a team. How do you tell your story and convey all those skills? That's what you need to work on. But that can be in the person statement, get, that can be repeated in the interview if there's a situation. If there's a question that demands it, yes, sure, talk about it. Next question, I think, is uh, must be in uh, most of the people's mind. Um, I have not done any research. Is it a good idea to add this in my weakness, like good weakness, and then justify it? And guide me, how can I justify my weakness in, in a good way? Because most people coming from Pakistan overseas, they, they lack this experience of research and they think it's a weakness. So who's going to answer this question? I can give yeah. mm -hmm. it um, from, from, the, so from the perspective of weakness. I think universally and generally, we are going to omit the word weakness altogether uh, and uh, saying all the things which they have done. Like, definitely, I agree with Dr. Naman that um, not having is uh, like not a possibility. But the concern here is that uh, if we categorize everything in weakness and we feel that that thing and it's a problem, it's not a problem. It's just something we need to express in a different way. Um, because I have done this, 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 I didn't have time to do research. I didn't, uh, because my passion was this much in this area, um, I haven't had um, um, have a look into research options, um, but would be open for the idea. So uh, more so giving it that it's not something which I didn't get in Pakistan. I didn't have the opportunity of that, but it was something which um, I didn't have time for at that time. Hmm. Can I add to that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. A sure. Very good uh, a suggestion, Dr. Sadha. Oh, another way is to, as I agree with Dr. Numan as well, just don't uh, mention it as a weakness, but add whatever you did in Pakistan. Like if you went to a volunteer on any, you know, um, uh, medical need throughout the country, anywhere, or you presented a poster um, in even your within your medical school years or outside in a competition, whatever, don't take it. To, nothing is small or big. Any presentation, any uh, you know thing that you can put on your CV, to they can ask you a question based on that. For example, if you had a like a um, local blood drive or um, you know cancer um, research foundation locally in Pakistan, there are so many other things. Thalassemia Foundation, even within our Fatma Jinnah Medical Association, we have a lot of, you know, any other clubs, you know, that you have participated medically, just put that on that, you know, everything brings you, we don't have to limelight that Pakistan doesn't have research opportunities. Um, you do what you have and you just present, take your conversation on that. That's it. That's what my suggestion would be. And I would just, uh, I wanted to just uh, um talk about this research thing because people get hyper-focused on it. Research uh, doesn't get you the spot, right? So uh, we don't want you to do research in the program. We want you to see patients clinically solid, having mm -hmm. medical knowledge base, and then research helps you. So you need to, you cannot put all your focus on the research. You have to take care of your good scores, uh, year of graduation, you take exams timely, and you have some uh, clinical experience. Uh, if uh, preferably U.S. clinic experience. Those are the three main components that'll get you in because they want you to work with the patients. Now, where research becomes important is if you are an older graduate, because then you are trying to fill the gaps and you have to show that this is what I've done. I've done some remarkable research. Your profile may get better. But if you are a recent graduate, your CV is otherwise good. What we are looking for is uh, it's a scholarly activity, which uh, Dr. Heba was talking about if you did some posters, if you presented in grand rounds and presentations, that is all scholarly. Just mention that and talk about it. And you say, I have interest in research. I have read about this and I like this area of research. I would like to explore this in your program. That's totally fair. Yeah. Great and advice. Some other activities, that, for example, medical, there are a lot of students I know who have done medical transcription, even from, you know, uh, add that. That's totally fine. 
Um, then some some graduates have come air and hair and done sleep studies or respiratory therapists. So just to fill in the gap in between, you know, and that's the just add that in there. Some some have done wound care. Some have done, worked in burn units. So all is all is all is beneficial and it really adds a lot of points to your resume. It doesn't have to be research. There are so many avenues in medical field um, that you can put on your resume, even for residency spots. Yes, and I just I want think, to, yes, sure. I just want to add that some community programs, they even don't want research. Uh, university programs, if you are applying for the university programs and just check out the website, if uh, there is heavy research going on, definitely you want to do some research and mention your research interest as well. But if the program you applied to, it doesn't have any research at all, should, you don't have to mention about it. Sure. Yeah, I think the main main anxiety I have seen in lots of international medical graduates and the concerns is they because they lack this research thing, so this is this is just occupying their mind and they're not thinking about the other, you know, amount of vast experience they had in back home. And there is no comparison, the amount of patients you have seen and interaction with those patients and the variety of diseases you have seen and your communication and interaction with patients. So never ever consider that you haven't done anything. If you haven't done research, research is not only the one thing that is going to take you into residency. So keep that in mind. Um, and uh, just uh, as Dr. Heba and Dr. Norman Ashraf said that anything counts, whatever experience you have from back home, just bring it into a positive experience and share that. So next question is, I have not received any interview yet and even any correspondence. Uh, so it is delayed. Uh, is there anything wrong in my application process if I haven't received any communication or any correspondence? It's only been one week. I am. We our program is still reviewing. We have not sent out any invites. It's too early, so you have you have to wait. Yeah, it's too early. You want to give programs at least two three weeks. Some programs do it early, but uh, I think usually most of the program will start downloading after one week of the RS or RS opening, and then they will review it. That takes one to two weeks. So two three weeks is a fair game. Yeah. 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 So and some can... of the programs. I mean, I think they just um send invites to AMGs first and then do the IMGs part, like our program, they uh, interview for the first two months, I think they interview AMGs and then the later part in December, January and February, they do the IMGs. So it's fine, I think. Okay, I think this is a great question. The next question is how to answer, what will you bring to US healthcare system? <laughs> you can. So can you say, uh, repeat the question? I'm to answer, what will you bring to U.S. healthcare system? Oh, so many things. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's a loaded question. Yes. Uh, mashallah, we have a lot to bring to the U.S. healthcare system. Having gone through, you know, master's in international health myself, recently graduated. So the, I went through details about how the, you know, uh, your U.S. system is marginalized, you know, for a lot of stratas of the population. And we have a lot to learn from all over the world, especially um, been and work in you, Pakistan. You know, we know we have a lot of work and bring things here. And each one of us can bring those experiences and actually um, like principles and guidelines down the road for the healthcare system. Uh, so firstly, you know, we have to... Um, bring like, you know, I mean, there's a lot of issues with uh, um, how we are over here gone, you know, a little bit back on uh, letting our clinical acumen um, like stay behind versus dependency on labs and dependency on uh, um, just, you know, high end advancement technology, radiological technologies, they have great value. But you cannot, you know, uh, pay little attention to the clinical sick skills that we learned back home. Um, so you have to keep the history and clinical skills. So the basics will still say, save a patient at the end of the day. Um, that's one thing. Um, then, you know, I mean, a patient is not on all tests and numbers. Uh, patient at the end is a 
personal you know engagement with a human being and helping them get better it's not that they don't pay attention on that year but having a little bit more personalized interaction and uh, taking care of the cultural sensitivities you can bring that thing here um, majority of the men graduates have not been out, outside of the us you know maybe to the caribbean at the most but not diverse as we are um, so that's one thing. The third most important thing is you definitely speak a different language, at least two, you know, even if you're Pakistan, you know, I mean, maybe a regional language and maybe uh, definitely Urdu. So that definitely brings a bigger, you know, spectrum of clinical experience and uh, human experience with you to the residency program. Uh, that's one thing. And then uh, you can you can change a whole lot of things over here with your clinical experience be proud of what you are you have gained over there and bring it here and um, maybe interact and teach and lead the way if you can yeah that's my thought on it thank you Heba. if you want to add something i'm sorry do you want to add something um i would second with uh, dr Heba. um one of the thing is that um all we have done is um, a lot and we have a little time to, so we uh, want to tell them that uh, we have these clinical skills and uh, they they are going to further increase okay. and add to what we are going to serve and what we are going to um, master in. Yeah, I think being coming from diverse groups, you can be strong advocates for patients uh, from different backgrounds and you can be, uh, you know, you have all the, um, experience that you can bring into us and uh, who are interacting in different communities and different groups and different people and your language uh, your resilience can prove that okay next question is if you if you completely draw a blank on a question is it okay to say that um, can we come back to this and take some time I did answer that, you know, I mean, they're also checking how um, good communicator you are, you know, improvise, try to answer the question in the real time. That would be also uh, in my, that's my opinion. And I wouldn't want to at that level of maturity and graduate education, I wouldn't want anyone to be not be able to answer a question. You know, it may be a simple answer. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be concocted. You just say what you have to say and be happy with that. You don't have to go into explanation. Oh, oh I think I I have to t go back and revise. You can add something if you remember, but just answer that as you would as a confident person. So just take that on, take that question, answer it to your best, and go with the flow. That's it. Okay, so I think this question is coming particularly from a from a, from an FJite. <laughs> How should we address the question if it comes in the way that how do you think getting trained in a woman-only institution would have different than the majority of students who studied in co-education? Yes. You can, I, I think I have, uh, I you and I have been, even in US, you know, I have tried myself as coming from a women-only institution and I proved myself no less than anybody else with my peers and, uh, um, it was a totally universal training. The uh, academic curriculum is no different than any other curriculum of any medical school across the globe. Um, and uh, our teachers, our faculty um, is not just female, male and uh, accomplished in, in all walks of life and uh, academically as well as personally. They have been good role models professionally as well as academically and personally and character wise. So I don't think it puts me at any out of spot position to compete with anybody across the globe, including U.S. residents. And and we saw about many of patients, including males, females. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was no gender discrimination when we were seeing about right. Here. And patients, we see all patients. Actually, we are more confident in revealing and improving and showing ourselves than maybe in a co-ed institution. We have a little bit more confidence in who we are within our female institution. I think that's what 
it gave me at least. Yeah, and I just want to add that in clinical settings, uh, even in uh, our hospital, uh, Gangaram Hospital, we had uh, co-residents like all of them. They were males as well in internal medicine, in surgery. Over there, we had male residents from other uh, hospitals or colleges as well. So we, I think we have interaction with them and we are uh, fine. And even over here, when we come and we have observerships and clinical experiences, volunteer work in US, we interact with everyone and uh, I don't think so there's any problem. Good. As we are waiting for invites, is it good idea to send programs a letter of interest now or still have to wait, especially for psychiatry? I think, uh, uh, as I said, two, two weeks, you want to give them at least two weeks to three weeks, and then you can send out a letter of interest. It has to be very brief um, that someone can just read it like in uh, even on their cell phone, um, just concise way, talk about the highlights, your scores, uh, why you're interested in um, some important things, like if you have published something. So just work on the elevator pitch, just convert it into text form very brief, and then maybe two and a half to three weeks out of the application, you can just send a, a letter of interest and let them know you're interested in the program. So I think uh, main questions we have answered uh, in the group chat and some of the questions were answered by the panelists already I see in the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always send us privately as well. We are over time now. It's been, uh, uh, I think, 1.09 now uh in eastern standard time so i would like to thank all the presenters the panelists who joined us today and all the listeners who joined us today and i wish all, each and every one of you all the very best be very patient with your interview calls as uh, dr naman ashraf and other uh, program directors here and everybody's telling you uh, inshallah you will be receiving your calls pretty soon just prepare yourself and make yourself ready for the interview. Uh, most of you have already attended many sessions, gone to the websites, prepare for mock interviews. Uh, Dr. Ashraf has been sharing on YPC Facebook page for all the mentors to sign up for mock interviews in FJ group, especially for all the FJs. Uh, whoever is uh, preparing for mock interviews, please share with us in our WhatsApp group. If you're interested in mock interviews, please give us a list, whoever is interested for mock interview, inshallah, we will connect you with the mentors uh, for one-to-one -one session. So thank you so much, everyone, for your time today and best of luck, inshallah. See you around.